Can you think of occasions where um, one statement just stopped you in your tracks or shed a whole new light on a situation? Maybe it, it even made you wish you had not said what you just said or you wish you hadn't done what you had done after that person said that. When I was growing up, I was blessed to live in a two-parent family where my mom, for the most part, did not work outside the home and just did a wonderful job of caring for my two sisters and me. And, and I don't think I'd say we we're spoiled, of course not, but, but we, were, we were well cared for. We were well, even down to, to the lunches that mom would pack for us every day. I mean, they were packed with love, you know what I mean? Packed with love. Well, of course, as kids... You always compared at the lunch table uh, what you had and what other persons had for the purposes of trading. And so that was a, a public affair for sure. Well, one lunch hour, I was probably in first grade, maybe second. Uh, I was sitting next to a boy in my class who pulled out something I'd never seen before, never seen one of these before, a fried egg sandwich for lunch. It was nasty looking. The, the, the bread was stale looking, you know. One, one piece of bread was actually the heel. I, I didn't know anybody ever ate those things. The heel of the loaf. All it had on it was, was this, this dry fried egg and maybe a little bit of mayonnaise or something. So, so I started making fun of the kid. Yeah, right, right there at the lunch table, telling him how terrible it looked, how, how my dog wouldn't even eat that sandwich. We didn't even have a dog, but, but I, I felt the need to, to share that. Of course, everybody at the table is now laughing, which encourages me just to tell more jokes and all the rest. And, and I'll never forget when, when the laughter died down. The, the boy said, not in pity, but just pretty matter-of-factly, as I recall, while my mom died and my dad has to pack my lunch before he goes to work, and that was all that we had today. Yeah. You, you know that happened about 50 years ago, and I'm still embarrassed to think about what I said. In fact, you might say, you know, I feel like pummeling you right now. Well, feel free just to, <laughs> just to storm the pulpit and beat me upside the head for sure, or, or boo, or just whatever you think you, you need to do. But, but it was just, it was one of those statements by him that, that completely changed the view of the situation, where, where now... Now, everything came into much clearer focus with the facts on the table. And I'll tell you, I was ashamed. I was incredibly ashamed. Well, well the reason that I, I raised that this morning is because that is the way the book of the Bible that we have been studying the last couple of months together actually ends. Jonah's in the middle of what you could probably best describe as a, a ministerial hissy fit. And it actually gets worse in the, the latter verses in the chapter. And then, then God speaks. God speaks. And it doesn't say much, but his words bring incredible clarity into that subject of how much he and Jonah were different. With that in mind, please open your Bible now to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4, that's on page 658 of the front section of the Bible under the chair in front of you if you need that this morning. So Jonah chapter 4, or page 658 of the, the front section of the Bible, under the chair in front of you, our theme all year is loving our world. That's what we're talking about, especially this year, although we talk about it every year. And the, the, the last couple of months, we've been doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of an Old Testament prophet named Jonah. And this is one of those lessons by contrast. In other words, chapter after chapter, the, the lesson is, don't be like this guy. A study of contrast, because he was a, a loveless prophet, and by God's grace, we don't have to be that way, because Jesus Christ died on the cross, making it possible for us to repent and believe in him, and then be transformed from the inside out to think about life and ministry differently. We can be anti-Jonas, and that has been the point of this series. We, we don't want to be like this loveless prophet. Well, Here's the short version of Jonah's story thus far. At the very beginning of the book, God comes to him and says, Arise, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh, which was a principal city of the nation of Assyria and therefore enemies of the nation of Israel. But still, the Lord wanted them, these Assyrians, 
to know about their need for repentance and the possibility of being forgiven and brought in right relationship with Jehovah, with the God of heaven and earth. See, that was one of the central aspects of the mission that God had given his chosen nation, Israel, that to enjoy the blessings of, of knowing and serving God, not as an end in itself, but then in turn modeling and proclaiming that message so other nations through them could be blessed that was a central portion, even of the, the Abrahamic covenant at the early chapters of the book of uh, Genesis. So, so, arise, go to Nineveh. Well, Jonah just flat out disobeyed God and headed the other way. Can you imagine a person doing that? Hmm? And the Lord had to judge Jonah. The, the way of the transgressor is hard. So, so yeah, the Lord had to judge Jonah because he loved him. And then, thankfully, Jonah repented he asked God's forgiveness, and he was even reassigned to the original ministry task. Now, get to Nineveh. So he went, and God blessed, and amazingly, the entire city, even the cows, the entire city repented, and I'm not saying the cows repented, by the way, but they did put sackcloth on the cows, on the beast, just to be sure that everybody knew that we're all repenting and placing our belief in God. Well, well, just when you think, this is going to be a happy ending to this book, huh? You come to chapter 4, and at times you just want to scream at Jonah, but that seems just a little bit hypocritical because it's pretty easy to recognize ourselves in these verses. Is it okay for me to say that? That, that there is a little bit of Jonah in each one of us. And so we have been trying to scour this story, just wring out everything that we can from these verses to find out how can we not be like that. Well, today we're at the end of chapter 4. We're talking about developing godly compassion. You want to do that, don't you? I mean, can you think of anything more important for us to talk about than that? that what, what does it mean to develop godly compassion, to be anti-Jonah's in the power of Christ. That's what we're talking about now. Let's start in chapter 4, verse 1. But, but it, it meaning the repentance of the Ninevites and God's choice to forgive them, it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, again, there that their repentance and your forgiveness I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. Seriously? For, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you, have, do you have good reason to be angry? Fascinating question. No indication in the text that Jonah ever answers. Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. In other words, maybe they didn't fully repent. Maybe God's not going to fully relent. Maybe they'll burn anyway was the whole point of that. Verse 6, so the Lord God appointed and, and Look for this word. It's going to be used repeatedly. The Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy, deliriously happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And there you hear that question again. And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. And you can decide what voice you want to insert in that response was it the defiant voice? Was it the angry voice? Was it the whiny voice? Whatever voice you put in there, it's bad. Don't ever say that to God if it's not true. Then, then he hears the lunchroom punch in the gut statement. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work. Follow the logic. And which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? The great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals. 
Commentator O. Palmer Robertson, and if you're looking for a a, a book to buy just to help you in the future as you would study this book again, this is one of my favorites. He said, the book of Jonah may be summarized in one word, compassion. The centrality of compassion does not become explicit until its last chapter, but that's the way a good story often unfolds. Now, often the best teaching is done by contrast. You appreciate the speed of an Olympic runner when you see him or her leave the pack behind. You see the greatness of God's compassion to the Ninevites when you set it beside Jonah's reaction. That really is a a good summary of these verses. And with the time we have remaining, I'd like us to study this text in five, five principles from the striking contrast between God and His errant servant. I, I would encourage you even now to be praying and asking the Lord, are there any ways that I'm like Jonah? And if so, I want to do business with that through the power of your word, for the glory of your son, right here, right now. Five principles from the striking contrast between God and his errant servant. One is Jonah's emotions revealed the shallowness of his heart. You notice several times in this passage, God asked Jonah to evaluate the validity of what was occurring emotionally. And we'll walk down specifically about that in a moment. But at this point, think about this. Sometimes persons make the mistake of believing, well, if I'm feeling it, it must be right. If I'm feeling it, then my position is validated. So if I'm angry, I have a right to be angry. If I'm happy, it's appropriate for me to be happy. In other words, my emotions are always valid. And my emotions comprise the sum of who I am, or at least the most important aspect of who I am. And what we're seeing here is no, instead of just assuming that your emotions are justified or that your emotions are unchangeable, instead ask, what are my emotions right now revealing about the condition of my heart? Let's just push the pause button on that for a moment. Think back this past week to times when you were especially emotional. Say, who called you? Nobody called me. But just think back (laughs) to times when you this past week were either positively or negatively. Something really made you angry. Something really made you worried. Something really made you sad or really made you happy or really made you excited. And I would encourage you, lock onto that event right now. Right now, and just analyze this, what what does that emotional experience reveal about the condition of your heart? Hmm. Now back to Jonah. Would it be fair to say that Jonah had cultivated an incredibly shallow heart? So let's break that down a bit. Rich theology didn't move him. Verse 2 of chapter 4 is a robust description of the character of God based on that marvelous passage in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 34. So Jonah says, I know that you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. That is a great description of the character of God, huh? Until you realize Jonah's actually speaking these words as part of a complaint. You're gracious and merciful, and I don't like it. You're slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and that ticks me off, at least when you extend these characteristics to people I don't like. And to speak the words recorded in verse 2 as anything other than heartfelt praise of the God who possesses these attributes shows the shallowness of his heart. Rich theology doesn't move him. Doesn't move him. God's counsel didn't move him. One observation we need to make about this text is that Jonah never answered God's question in verse 4. The Lord's gracious enough to counsel him. If you were God, wouldn't you have had about your fill of Jonah by now? But God continues to counsel him. Do you have a right to be angry? Yet Jonah doesn't answer, at least as far as we know. And that goes along with what we were seeing a moment ago. Jonah, instead of just assuming that your emotions are the most important thing about you or that they'll always be valid, they're always justified, take the time to consider what your emotional state right now reveals about the condition of your heart. Uh, On the other hand, temporary pleasure made him deliriously happy. Now, we haven't really talked about all of the storyline here. Here's a short version. Verse 5 tells us that that, that Jonah goes to the outskirts of the city. See, after they repented, 
After God relented from the calamity that would have fallen on them because of their wickedness, now they've been forgiven. So Jonah goes to the outskirts of the city where he can still see the city in the distance. And the logical explanation for that is he hopes Nineveh is going to be judged anyway. Either because they hadn't fully repented or maybe God wouldn't keep his word. And you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Listen, it doesn't have to make sense because when you're running from God, your thoughts get all twisted up and irrational anyway. True that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's setting up this little camp and hope that the Ninevites are about, he's going to watch them burn. That's, that's the point. Burn, baby, burn. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, speaking of burning, it's hot. <laughs> It's hot out. So the text says that God causes a plant to grow up to, to shade Jonah from the heat. Robertson observes, see the goodness of God. He gives concrete evidence to Jonah that he still regards him with the tenderest love, even now. Even though he intends to show mercy to the Ninevites, his love still has plenty of room for Jonah and the Israelites as well. And so verse 6 makes it clear that this gourd, this gourd or whatever it was, makes Jonah, the text says, deliriously happy. Think about that. He couldn't care a lick about the fact that the Ninevites had repented or that now they're not going to face judgment. He wasn't happy about that at all. He wasn't guilty about the fact that he was now running from God again. So, so those appropriate emotional responses to the facts of what were occurring, that, that wasn't going on at all. Instead, He's wrapped up in this gourd. <laughs> this gourd. I'm happy about a gourd. Deliriously happy about a gourd. In other words, this, this temporary relief from today's inconvenience. Oh. <laughs> oh. One other upshot of his shallow heart was that discouragement came easily. Now, I, I want to be very careful here. I understand this is tender ground. I, I recognize there's Plenty of people in our church family who are going through extreme, extremely deep water. Nobody, nobody is saying that such persons ought to be giddy and happy in some sort of a trite, superficial way. I'm not talking about that. But the fact of the matter is Jonah is quitting. He says he wished death for himself and said it's better for me to, to die than to live. And what that teaches us is the way we respond to trials and difficulties reveals the condition of our hearts now, what else can we observe from these verses? Jonah's emotion revealed the thinking of his heart. Now, I realize you might say, well, thinking of the heart, how, how does that fit together? It's very important that in this message, and frankly, any time that we would use the word heart at our church, we're going to be using it in a way that is consistent with Scripture, which is different than the way our world often uses it. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying we try to be biblically accurate here in our terminology. That's why if you're a guy here, you may remember a number of years ago in our Men of Faith program, we actually worked expositionally through all 700 plus uses of the word heart in the Bible because it's a, a central word and it's much more than just the seed of the emotions. You've heard people talk about how, well, I feel with my heart, but I think with my head. I mean, that, that's completely unbiblical. In Scripture, the word heart is the most comprehensive term to describe your inner person. So it includes your soul. It includes your spirit. It includes your mind, the way you think. It includes your desires, what you want. It includes your will, what you choose. All of that is encapsulated in this word heart. A good working definition of the term would be your control center. So that's why we would read a, a verse like Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart. See, it's not head-heart distinction. As he thinks in his, that, that's why, by the way, Scripture also tells us guard your heart. So, so guard what you think, guard what you want, guard what you choose, guard how you feel, guard your heart for out of it are the issues of life. So now I'm talking to you about how what was happening emotionally in this text, it reveals the, the patterns of thinking in Jonah's heart. Another way of saying that is we're talking about your core beliefs. You have them, I have them, Jonah had them. You're, you're, in other words, the interpretive grid that you bring to any situation. It's like the, the glasses through which you view the facts. You may have noticed that I got glasses now. You notice that? And um, they are driving me crazy. I'm just going to tell you right now they are. 
And you might say, well, you were crazy already. I know, I know. I had no more bandwidth for additional cray-cray. But here we are with these glasses. And um, don't be tweeting that. But, but anyway, a- anyway so, 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 but, but I'll tell you this. I, it is amazing. I can now see my notes. It's amazing. I, doesn't mean I'm going to stay on them. But I can see what I'm departing from. I can see you a whole lot better. And I just want to announce publicly, you look so much more beautiful than I ever recognized. I would have been more thankful for you had I known how marvelously gorgeous you were. But, but anyway, so, so now, now I got this. This is the, 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 the lens through which I, I view my life. Well, you have core beliefs, core beliefs. What you absolutely think at the depth of your heart that you believe is true. And that becomes the interpretive grid through which you view the actions of your spouse, the actions of your kids, what your boss does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So so understanding what are my core beliefs, uh, uh, that's crucial. So so what what were some of Jonah's core beliefs? And, and is it possible that you could have the same core belief which is taking you the wrong direction? What do we see in this text? Well, well, one... And Jonah believed it's acceptable to be spiritually indifferent to other people groups. Uh-oh. See, I said all along, Jonah was a racist. That's what this book is about. Jonah did not want God's grace extended to, to those Ninevites. He had written off an entire uh, people group because of their ethnicity. Is it possible for a person like you or me to, to, to not do what we were singing about earlier today, to be a person of compassion because we have a core belief that it's okay to not like certain people groups? I don't like those black people. I don't like those white people. I don't like those Asians. I don't like those Hispanics. I don't like those poor people. I don't like those rich people. I don't like those... Right? If that's part of your core belief and you have come to the position that that's acceptable, here's what today ought to be for you, a funeral. So what do you mean a funeral? That needs to be put to death. And today would be a really good day. And now would be a really good time. And I realize you might say, what? I just came to the church house to get a little entertainment before I went over to lunch. Well, apparently God wanted you to have a little bit more than that. Now it's time for you to decide what you're going to do with it. Because there is absolutely no place in the heart of a follower of Jesus Christ to ever think that it's acceptable to be spiritually indifferent to other people groups. And for Jonah, it was those Ninevites. And I would just ask you, is there anybody in that category for you? Also this, the the belief, the, the core belief that it's acceptable to manipulate with pity parties. I mean, how many times have we seen Jonah run to this, just take my life statement? And there's nothing wrong, and here's the contrast, there's nothing wrong with respectfully voicing your concerns to God. I'm not talking about that. In fact, we see that often in the book of Psalms, so I'm not talking about that, but that's not what this is. This is manipulation. This is threats. This is game playing. And listen, for some people who will hear this message today, that is their default button. It's amazing how frequently they just default into manipulating. And there's all sorts of variations on the theme. There's anger. There's yelling. There's stomping. There's crying. There's slamming. There's pouting. There's threatening. There's screeching. There's squealing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of foolish behavior... It reveals the foolish thinking in a person's heart. And we're not here to say, man, what a goof Jonah was. We're here to ask, is there any of that in me? And if that is hindering my ability from loving the world in which God has placed me, I need to do business with that, like right now. Like right now. Or this, it's acceptable to prefer your plan to God's. Well, I know in some situations we would say, well, I wasn't really sure what God was up to. I, I get that. You couldn't say that about Jonah. I mean, Jonah clearly told, um, or was told by God up front what he was to do, and Jonah didn't like it. And apparently he thought a perfectly acceptable option was him saying, I, I don't care what God wants me to do. I prefer my plan over his. Thank you very much. You realize we'll have people who hear this sermon today, and that's exactly the path they're on right now. They know what the Word of God says. 
and they are heading the other direction. I'll tell you, what are you doing as a pastor? I'm doing everything I possibly can to grab that person and get them back on the right track. And here's why. The way of the transgressor is hard. You might think you're smarter than God. Here's today's newsflash. You're not. And the day will come when that will be proven. And wise is the person who has a funeral for that habit of thought, if it exists really, really quickly. Or here's another one. My emotions are the byproduct of the choices or actions. I I realize, I mean, I I can read the emails already. (laughs) For those who say, well, I have to feel this way. Uh, I have to feel this way because of what so-and-so has done or what so-and-so has not done, friend. Now, I love you. I love you. You feeling it? That is a very fatalistic way to live. And that's a very incorrect way to live. We we use this illustration around here from time to time, but if I knock this glass of water like this, eventually there's going to be some water on the floor, right? There it is right now. Why is there water on the floor? And you can say, well, there's water on the floor because you knocked it. Well, an equally compelling answer to that question is there's water on the floor because there was water in the cup. Had there been coffee in the cup, which would have been my preference, by the way, had there been coffee in the cup, there would not be coffee on the floor. And we want to blame our life on all of the external, he didn't do this, she didn't do that, blah, blah, blah. When the fact of the matter is those external forces simply reveal uh, the content of our own heart. I can never say I had to feel in that particular fashion. And then there's this, if you believe it, it must be true. You sure about that? Here's the great text that disproves that. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? What was the anticipated answer to that question? No, it's not, and I ought to repent right away. But what does Jonah say? And again, you have to decide the voice, but whatever inflection you use, it's bad. It's right for me to be angry even to death. What a great example of how it's possible to sincerely, I mean, way sincerely believe something. And be sincerely wrong, wrong. Now, now, how do we apply this? I mean, this book, let's start moving into some applicational perspectives. Well, ministry effectiveness requires developing biblical compassion. And I realize you could say, well, that didn't happen in this text. That God overrode at what Jonah had done. I understand that. Here's the bottom line. God will accomplish his will one way or another with you or without you. Do you understand that? So it's not like what we're trying to do at the Hartford Hub is dependent on you. God will get his work done there one way or the other. And you understand, God will work his will either by blessing your obedience, because it is blessed to follow God. Do you believe that? He'll either bless you for your obedience or he'll judge you for your disobedience, but he will receive glory from your life. So so when I... And talk about this in this particular way. I'm talking about ministerial effectiveness from the perspective of you and me being the compassionate people that Christ stands ready to help us be so that we can be right in the center of accomplishing all that God wants us to accomplish with our lives. Well, ministry effectiveness requires developing biblical compassion. I think Robertson is right when he says that this is the one-word summary of this book, compassion And, of course, the questions all of us then have to face would be, well, do I understand biblical compassion? Do I even know what that is? And you could also branch it out. Is this church known in part for being a a compassionate church? Am I like God or am I like Jonah? And you might say, well, I I need some more information. Okay, let's talk about the term for a minute, compassion. It's the Hebrew word hus, and it literally means it's very important. It means to look with pity. So one theological word book it defines the word like this, the, the feeling which goes out toward one who is in trouble. That, that's a good starting place. The, then you have this definition, which I think helps us even more, a positive attitude toward the object with the intention of performing a helping act. So it's not like television. I watch it, I get all wound up emotionally, and I go away and do nothing. The hoose includes action. So, so even this just English uh, definition might help. Sorrow for the sufferings or troubles of another or others accompanied by an urge to help. Deep sympathy or pity. That's a very important definition. It gets us 
pretty far down the road. But here, here's one more piece of information that might help. Now, this word hus, it used multiple times in the Old Testament, in, in, a, in a surprising number of times. Now, now lock onto this. The, the subject of the verb is I. E-E-Y-E, special emphasis on the I. So we would have verses like this, Ezekiel 16, 5, no I pitied you to do any of these things for you to have compassion on you. Or Ezekiel 20, verse 17, nevertheless, my I spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. And see, what would be the relationship between showing compassion and your eyes? Well, the answer is the way you view something or someone is going to have a dramatic impact on your ability and your willingness to show compassion. See, God looked at the Ninevites and he saw one thing. Jonah looked at the same group of people, same group of people, and saw something entirely different. Now, when we broaden this out to the English word compassion in our Bibles, We find it used in all sorts of marvelous ways. For example, with reference to those who are poor, he will spare the poor and needy and will save the souls of the needy. The word spare in that particular text is our Hebrew word, hus. He'll spare the poor and the needy. With reference to God's forgiveness, but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them had compassion on them, or reference to our treatment of others. Think about this, and think about all the interactions you've had all week long with all sorts of people. Thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice, show mercy and compassion everyone to his brother. How do you stand up on on that one? With reference to the way Jesus viewed people, but, but when he saw, there it is, saw the multitudes, he was moved with, that happened to Christ. Moved with compassion because they were weary. Do you care about that? And, and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. It's interesting how often this comes up regarding forgiveness. Should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant, the king said, just as I had pity on you. Or, or here's an interesting text. I just heard a sad story about a church in a different state that just blew up in some sort of a a silly argument that resulted in a nasty split in the church. And now, by the way, with social media, it can even get worse because now you have all these goofs who take their sinful words to social media. So now everybody in the town is watching the church split unfold on Twitter. Are you kidding me? Let me post that on Facebook. Well, Well, how about this? Finally... All of you be of one mind. There's an idea. Major on the majors. Be of one mind. Having what? Having compassion for one another. Even if I disagree on some trite matter. Having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Well, what's the big picture? One of the great distinctions between God and Jonah was that not only did God possess the right kind of compassion, biblical compassion, sorrow for the condition of others accompanied by an urge to help, and his prophet Jonah did not. And I hope, I hope you're letting the Word of God, I mean, please tell me you're not planning your activities this afternoon, unless you're planning them through the lens of this text. Who all do I need to go show compassion to? You can do that. But if you're thinking about hot dogs right now, I'm going to try to have compassion on you anyway. But I hope hope you're asking this question, are you a person of biblical compassion? And is this church known in part for its compassion? If you've been around here for any period of time, you've probably heard me mention this book, The Church of, of Irresistible Influence. It's written by a a pastor in Little Rock who, um, when I first read this book and learned about what they were seeking to do with their church and their community, I read it about a decade ago, I thought, this guy's been reading our mail. It's amazing how much what they're trying to accomplish in their church mirrors what we're trying to do here. In fact, if I had my way, everybody in our church would read this book. And I know a lot of you have, but some of you haven't. So, So here's a little homework assignment. You know that 
I just have to say it. You know that romance novel you were going to read on the beach on vacation? You know what you need to do with that? You need to put in the shredder. That's why God invented shredders. So you need to put that hot mess in the shredder, and you need to get a good book like this. You say, you're telling me you want me to read a theology book about ecclesiology on the beach on my vacation. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. This is a great, great book, very, very helpful in, in all sort of ways. Here's, here's what Lewis said. He said, a real vision, of course, interesting vision, uh, is seeing what God clearly wants us to be. And through the grid of the New Testament blueprint, the idea of being or remaining a church club or a church success story becomes noxious. Do you agree with that? Who wants to be a country club? Who wants that? In seeking to become a church of irresistible influence, church leaders must again, in practical terms, envision for their people the church as profiled by Jesus and the apostles within the pages of the New Testament, which would include these three things. A church passionately committed to Jesus Christ and the proclamation of the gospel. Would we all agree with that? Absolutely. And a church of, of winsome lifestyles punctuated by high moral standards. Would we agree with that? Yeah. And then thirdly, a church of radical love and selfless good deeds that amazes the world around it. See, that's where biblical compassion leads. And there's no reason why that can't happen in our community. There's no reason that can't happen in any community because biblical compassion is a powerful thing. Do you believe that? Biblical compassion is a, a powerful thing. Now, let's go back to our, our contrast. What does the Lord's final recorded conversation with Jonah teach us? Well, too often God's people are passionate. Yeah, they're passionate about the wrong things, about the wrong things. The Lord's trying to get Jonah to see you had compassion, but, but it was on a plant. And that brings us to a very important point logically. On the one hand, some of God's people don't seem to have much passion about anything. You know those kind of people? Uh, bland, vanilla, boring, their, their life is passionless. Well, that kind of apathy surely does not please the Lord. But on the other hand, it's the person who has plenty of passion just not for things that matter. And that's why this description in verse 10 is so important expositionally. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you didn't work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Now think about some of your passions and judge them through the lens of that verse. Some of our passions are wrong because we weren't responsible for them in the first place. Let me just pick an example. Let's say that somebody does not give you the credit or the respect you think you deserve, so all of a sudden you're up in arms about that, you're throwing a fit, you're demanding this, you're demanding that, you're passionate about it. Well, well wait a minute, who gave you those abilities to begin with? Is that your intellect or the intellect that God gave you? Are those your abilities or the abilities that God gave you? It's amazing how many things we get passionate about promoting or protecting that we didn't have anything to do with in the first place. Or wrong because you can't control them. And Jonah, after I gave you the gourd, you had absolutely nothing to do with it growing. You're passionate about something over which you had absolutely no control. And that brings us to a very important theological point in this book. We've seen it all the way through, but especially in the verses we're studying this morning, that repeated use of the phrase, and God appointed. God appointed, God appointed. In other words, an emphasis throughout the book on the sovereignty of God. He controls all aspects of his creation in a dramatic fashion. Well, what impact is that supposed to have on us? Hey, a liberating one. Because we don't have to waste our passion on that because God has that covered. Why would we siphon off all of, any of our passion on worry? Why would we siphon off any of our passion on anxiety or, or, or fretting? You undoubtedly saw this, this terrible tragedy with the airliner from Egypt. Well, guess what I'm getting ready to step on tomorrow morning? <laughs> Yet another airliner going through beautiful Newark up to Scroon Lake where I have the privilege of teaching this week. Well, you see all these planes go down, and that can play havoc with your brain if you allow it to. And all of a sudden, you're all passionate about worrying and all passionate about fretting and all passionate about this and this and this, wasting time and attention from what God really has for you today. 
And frankly, what I, I was just making my list yesterday of everything I've got to get done at Word of Life next week, including on the plane. So if I'm on a plane, I am working. There's books flying all over the place. There's pens flying. The guy sitting next to me hates sitting next. I'm asking him, could you hold my markers? I mean, it's just, it's just a crazy, because I got just a lot to do tomorrow. That means I don't have any reserve passion for worrying. I don't have any reserve passion for fretting. Who is in charge of getting me safely to my destination or getting me to heaven tomorrow? The sovereign God of heaven and earth. And I don't want to waste passion and, and miss the opportunities that God has for me tomorrow. In fact, my most important job, because here's the other side of it, my most important job tomorrow may be something that's not on my to-do list today. And maybe talking to the person sitting right next to me on that airline, or if I'm all worried and fretting and wasting my passion on things that are not my business anyway, I very well may miss the important ministry opportunity that's right before these, these eyes. Also wrong because they have little or no eternal value. I mean, if this story seems a little bit bizarre, it's purposely so. You understand that? This thing comes up overnight, it perishes overnight, and you're, Jonah, you're all wound up about a gourd? It's a gourd for crying out loud. You don't care about the eternal destiny of an entire city. That's the emphasis on eternal issues, but you're passionate about a gourd that's just going to be a heap of mush 24 hours later. Why do you think that would be in the Bible, friends? Does any of that sound familiar? Passion, oh yeah, passion on the right things, like God, hmm. not nearly as often as we should. Well, where does that take us? Verse 11, the end of the book. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know the difference between their right and their left hand as well as many animals? Godly compassion is focused on people in need. Several times in this book, God has referred to the city of Nineveh as a great city. And you might say, why, why would you call it a great? It's wicked. In fact, at the very beginning of the book, God makes it clear it's wicked. And everything we know about it from secular history would confirm that notion. So they certainly weren't morally great. Well, then why are they great, Lord? That, that question was just answered in that verse. Nineveh was a great city because of the significant number of, of souls that lived there. And see, think about what we learned a moment ago regarding compassion. Jonah's compassion on this plant had to do with regretting its loss. Could it be that God's compassion on people is focused on the eternal destiny of their souls? You understand the Bible many times when it's just giving a, a number of how many people were there, it doesn't say 120,000 men or women. It says 100, many times 120,000 souls. You see that throughout the Bible. I, I think we would be very wise to consider people, not, well, that's a person that I'm going to get something from. That, that's a person that I could misuse. And, no, that's a person who is a soul. That's a person whose soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. And do I really care about that? Do, do I have pity about that that is going to move me to action? I think that ought to encourage us to ask some questions that go right along with our theme this year, loving our world. See, see how concerned are you? Not how you would answer it on your theology exam, but, but think about actions. How, how concerned are you? for the eternal destiny of those who live and work around you? And does that concern produce an obvious and practical compassion? Now, I realize you might say, well, Pastor Bryce, I'll tell you your problem. You've not been to my office. There ain't no, you know, no way to be compassionate to that hot mess. Or that you've not been to my neighborhood. You've never met my mother-in-law. <laughs> well, well, God even addresses that, doesn't he? And Nineveh was filled with people who needed a truth. The text says they don't even know the difference between their right hand or their left. And by the way, if you do know the difference between your right hand or your left morally, why is that? Why is that? Is that because you have superior intellect? Is that because you possess greater inherent worth? 
Or is it because God sovereignly brought someone across your path to teach you about Christ and teach you right from wrong? These churches in Little Rock back around um, the year 2000 actually got together, getting a group of churches together. Can you imagine that? And they published to their community a confession together. They said, realizing Christ's prayer is for all of his children to walk in unity with him and each other, we humbly confess our jealousy and envy, which has led to competition instead of cooperation, our prejudice, which has perverted the true picture of Christ's perfect love and acceptance, our pride, which has led us to exalt ourselves and and judge others, our apathy, which has hindered us from pursuing relationships with others, our disunity. They, They published this to the community. On behalf of the churches, our disunity, which has slowed the work of Christ through his church and caused his good news to be stifled. They went on to say, and and realizing that Christ weeps over the cities and came not to be served but to serve, we humbly confess our unconcern manifested by our failure to discover the real needs of our community, our prayerlessness for the needs of those around us. Our self-centeredness that has caused us to care more for ourselves than others, our, our selfishness in not giving the time, resources, and service we ought to to the people of central Arkansas. And then they said this, here's our commitment. By the grace of God and for his glory and the good of others, we commit this day on the eve of a, a new millennium to actively promote unity and fellowship among all true believers. This isn't some kind of mushy ecumenicalism that has no concern for truth. All, all true believers in Christ to vigorously stand against anything that fosters prejudice or divisiveness, to consistently pray for the people of central Arkansas and their leaders, and to lovingly serve the people of these cities through our individual lives, our churches, and our cooperative efforts. That's Christ-like compassion. That's Christ-like compassion that glorifies our Lord. And you know, just like Jonah went outside the city hoping that he could see it burn, Jesus Christ went outside the city with a cross to burn on our behalf, to make it possible for us to be anti-Jonah's. And what I would encourage you to do as we land the plane on this series is um, just take out the compassion thermometer, would you? Pop that thing in your arm and just ask yourself, how am I doing on the issue of compassion? And on a scale of 1 to 10, unless it comes out a perfect 10, and it won't, (laughs) or I'm going to have to issue the lion thermometer. um, (laughs) Ask yourself, what practical steps can I and our family take this summer to become less like Jonah and more like our compassionate God? Would you stand with me for prayer? Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to consider these matters. Thank you for this marvelous book. And Father, I pray for those who don't know Christ. I pray that today they would repent and believe so that they can have the transformation of heart that is so necessary to be what you want us to be. And Lord, when we think about Well, what we get passionate about so often, it just looks foolish. We pray that you would convict us and set us on a course of change. And Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities even this week to to demonstrate godly compassion. Help us to see like you see. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.